This is Father Gregory Pine. This is Father Joseph Anthony Cress. And this is Father Bonamister Chapman. And welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. So first of all, Father Joseph Anthony, nice work on the inflection with your introduction because it was like, oh, I usually the last person to speak, but I'm going to lead into the third person who speaks on this Lexio episode. So kudos. But also, yeah. speaking of recording yeah. episodes, we've been doing uh -huh. a lot of in-studio recording. And so we haven't, yeah. we haven't done this type of Lexio thing, well, since mm -hmm. Easter. Um, so <laughs> how's everyone doing? Uh, Father Bonaventure, how are things? Uh, I'm great. But the most important part is I think there's a bobblehead. Of Father Joseph there Anthony is. on the back there. Um, oh, there it so is. That's, that's, me. that's yeah, me. That's uh -huh. that's fantastic. That's really fantastic. I love that. Oh my god. Yeah, that's a real that's a real live bobblehead of me. Shout out to uh my sister. Yeah. Well, no, it's not. But uh shout out to my sisters who got that for me last Christmas. Um oh, I feel very know. Dwight Schrute esque uh because I have a real uh bobblehead of myself. Wow. My that's sisters, I mean nice. When you work in professional sports, I guess you end up with a bobblehead guy, um, which is who doesn't want one of those in their lives? Right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. I was once I was once trying to simplify my brother's life by getting rid of things that he didn't ask me to get rid of, uh, which is a thing that I do with it seems many people. Um, and I tried to give get rid of his bobbleheads, and he was like, "Nah, you're not. <laughs> you're not touching those things." So uh, that's my wife's job to get rid of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, we're going to start with the collect from the Mass of this second Sunday of Advent. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, may no earthly undertaking hinder those who set out in haste to meet your Son, but may our learning of heavenly wisdom gain us admittance to his company, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. All right, so we're going to head in. To our commentary on the readings, the first reading is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, if you would, Father Joseph Anthony. On that day, a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a bud shall blossom. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. Not by appearance shall he judge, nor by hearsay shall he decide, but he shall judge the poor with justice and decide aright for the lands afflicted. He shall strike the ruthless with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Justice shall be the band around his waist, and faithfulness a belt upon his hips. Then the wolf shall be a guest of the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion shall browse together with a little child to guide them. The cow and the bear shall be neighbors. Together their young shall rest. The lion shall eat hay like the ox. The baby shall play at by the cobra's den. And the child lay his hand on the adder's lair. There shall be no harm or ruin on my, all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be filled with knowledge of the Lord. As water covers the sea. And on that day, the root of Jesse, set up as a signal for the nations, the Gentiles shall, shall seek out, for his dwelling shall be glorious. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So each Advent season, obviously, we read from the book of the prophet Isaiah for a variety of reasons. One reason of which is that it's some of the clearest prophecy of our Lord's coming. So you've heard it said before, I think it was St. Jerome who said that the book of the prophet Isaiah is the fifth gospel, since it speaks so clearly of mm -hmm. the coming Lord. And here we start with a consideration of the spirit that rests upon him. And immediately you recognize the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. So wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, piety, fortitude, and the fear of the Lord. And it's fascinating that, you know, we talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit as something that we receive, but we don't often think about them as something that, that Christ has first or something that flows you know, through Christ to us. Um, but it's effectively the spirit that rests upon Christ, which is the spirit that he sends to us. So as is my wont in all Lexio Divina episodes, I try to make everything about the most blessed Trinity because it seems like the scriptures are really, you know, about the most blessed Trinity. Father Patrick makes fun of me, but he's not here. So cut loose. Um, when, when St. Thomas talks about the missions of the persons of the most blessed Trinity, he says, 
that the Father sends the Son as the author of sanctification, and that the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit as the gift of sanctification. So that Spirit rests upon the Son. Not that He needs to be sanctified, because He's God, and His Godhead makes Him holy beyond compare. But He receives a mission of the Spirit in a certain solidarity with us and to give us the same. And so when we think about our spiritual lives, sometimes we think about them as like standing apart from that of Christ. It's like Christ is over here doing his holy things and we're over here trying to do our holy things. You know, we need to accumulate however so many holy points before we can show back up in his presence and say, hey, look, I did some holy things. Whereas the truth of the matter is that we are incorporated in Christ. You're incorporated into Christ by our life in the church and reception of the sacraments and that we receive what is in fact his by right. So the drama of the Christian life isn't so much like doing good things and then presenting yourself before the Most High God and saying, hey, your thoughts on those good things. Rather, it's to seek to be conformed to the Most High God, right? As he is revealed in our Lord Jesus Christ, to be assimilated to him and so as to receive from the Spirit which rests upon him and which he in turn sends. So that is an exciting prospect, albeit a difficult one, but it needn't be overly complex. I think we complexify it when we try to do it by ourselves at a distance. Well, I want to reflect on the phrase, justice shall be the band around his waist and faithfulness a belt upon his hips. Um, that Hebrew parallelism struck me this time, since belts are rather important to Dominicans. Um, it's the black things you can see around us. The rest of our habit is white. Uh, also, I think they're important to basically everyone except the English um, who think that you can wear dress clothes and suits without belts. This always drove me nuts when I was over there, but I digress. Uh, the belt, the belt is the thing that in right in the middle of your wardrobe, it's the center in the sense of you. And it's the part that holds things up and ties things down. It's also the place where you attach things, ready to hand, keys, tools, weapons, rosaries, all that kind of thing. You carry them about with you without holding them. They're ready to be used. All right. What's this about? I think this is what justice, that's where justice is. It's the belt around our waist uh, and the band around our waist and the belt around our hips. It's not something too low to be trampled upon, uh, something minuscule or unimportant, but also not something too high to be merely speculated upon. Uh, justice, it seems, is a working man's or working class virtue. It's something that should go without saying. It's something that greases the society and our experience but would be worth saying something about if it weren't there. It's dependable, like a belt. It's where we hang things. And this is particularly important for the Christian because our mercy is hung on justice. Uh, it's the only reason why we have mercy is because there's an injustice done in a sense. So there's justice it, it's going past the other side of justice. Um, so that's where forgiveness and mercy come in, is they're hung on justice and the inability of our and our inability of making justice to God without his mercy. Justice giving to what each person owes, whether human or divine, is the virtue that holds society together. But of course it is mercy that raises each one of us and society up. The mercy that we are waiting for, celebrating this Advent season, a season in which we reflect on the lack of justice we have given to God and to others, uh, but the waiting and anticipation of mercy in the Christmas uh, mystery of the Incarnation. The, um, throughout this entire, and it's, it's somewhat of a lengthy first reading for us. Uh, it's got, it's, it takes a little while to get through. But one of the things that we find that happens uh, throughout is this kind of um, juxtaposition of different things. You, you have the wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the kid, um, the lion and the ox, and, and all these back and forth, the two the somewhat contradictory things that you can't figure out. Like that, that tends to be this like theme throughout this entire gospel selection is the, this repeated um, interaction of uh, animals that we would expect to be enemies or contradictions that would not inhabit the same location. But I think the the one kind of contradiction that stands out to me is the fact that it says here that in all of this, you know, the lion or the wolf and the lamb, the calf and the lion, um, but they will be they will have a little child to guide them. And the absurdity of letting a child guide the way, 
Um, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to have a number of friends who are starting their families and they have toddlers and the kids are learning to walk. And I, I, I don't know why, but it is a reality that especially when you travel and you're in airports, you see parents have their own kids on like backpack leashes because the kids can't leave. Like they can't, they no, nobody lets the child lead the way in that stuff, whether it's in the airport or in the, the grocery store or whatever it may be. You don't just let the child lead the way. But here, and this is exactly what Isaiah is talking about, is that it's the child. There will be the little child um, will lead um, lead all of this. And yes, we can look at that and think of um, the allusions to the incarnation and the beauty of the fact that God uh, takes on our flesh, but in the humility of coming as a child born of the Virgin. But there's also this deep reality of um, the spiritual life where maturity in the spiritual life looks like becoming like a child. And the fullness of our life in Christ is the fact that who Jesus is by nature, the, the, the Son of God, we become by grace, the adopted children of God. And so to allow ourselves to grow into a childlike reality, um, this is the heart of uh, St. Therese's little way. You know, she's the, the, of the child Jesus, and she becomes this little child who is completely dependent and affectionate and trusting of the Heavenly Father. And so that even in the midst of all of um, what Isaiah is talking about, we have it all hinging, um, and, and, and even in the selection, it kind of centers on the fact that is the all of this is led by a little child. And it's a preparation, but also an encouragement to uh, grow in our spiritual life but to not be afraid uh, if that growth of spiritual life looks like becoming more of a dependent child on the Father, a trusting child of, of the Father, a loving and affectionate child of the Father. Boom. All right. We're going to pass now to uh, the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, if you would read Father Bonaventure. Sure. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, Whatever was written previously was written for our instruction, that by endurance and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to think in harmony with one another, in keeping with Christ Jesus, that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another then as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a minister of the circumcised to show God's truthfulness, to confirm the promises to the patriarchs, but so that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When um, I hear the words of St. Paul in here, um, it's, it's something that he's constantly writing to uh, the different Christian communities to encourage them, to edify them, to uh, give them words of encouragement, to suffer well, and to endure in this Christian life, whatever the persecutions may be, or that. And this, in the letter to the Romans, is no different. And he makes it very explicit. He even uh, titles God, the God of endurance and encouragement. Um, and I think that is a, a source of our hope. And Paul even uh, gives an allusion to that and uh, directs that. But that may not be a phrase that we are used to hearing, um, referring to our God as the God of endurance, the God of encouragement. Um, I think for many people's uh, encounter with the faith or uh, experience, maybe I should say, their experience with the faith is here is the list of, you know, what it means to be a Christian. Here's what it takes. Here's the criteria. And maybe even here are the prerequisites that you have to accomplish before you being this full disciple of the Lord. And um, you have to accomplish all these things at the distance before you can enter into the fullness of the faith and be worthy to have a relationship with the Lord. And that's not what St. Paul is um, speaking of here. He calls God of endurance and encouragement. The beginning where we meet the Lord in whatever um, phase of life we may be in or um, situational and circumstances of our lives, but he encourages us 
to continue to grow, uh, encourage, encourages us to grow in virtue um, and, and faith, but also is the God of endurance that he, by his accompanying presence in the Holy Spirit that is given to all of us, that dwells within us via our baptisms, that it's that endurance to persevere through this pilgrimage. And so I think in the in the Advent season, to take time and reflect and maybe pray to the God of endurance and the God of encouragement as we continue our earthly pilgrimage. So um, two of the words that you identified, obviously, two of the words that feature prominently in this reading are endurance and encouragement. And uh, when it comes to encouragement, this is a, uh, a word that we hear often in the letters of St. Paul. Uh, it's one that is featured in one of the readings after the third Psalm and the Liturgy of the Hours at evening prayer on one Sunday. So we learn to hear like, may the God of encouragement encourage you with the encouragement with which we have been encouraged. And we're like, woof, this is some serious encouragement. But the word is paraklesis, which is the same root or the same uh, word in effect as the word that we use to describe the paraclete, who is an advocate, who is a defender, right? Who is one who seeks our justification. So this is again, the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, who is breathed forth by God from all eternity, who is sent into the world for our sanctification to beget in us hope and endurance. Um, and we have, you know, we have recorded episodes in the past about hope, but endurance is something about which we don't speak as much. Um, but like when St. Thomas talks about the virtue of fortitude, he breaks it into two parts. He says, you've got like the attack part, so you can think about battlefield courage, but then you've also got the hunker down part, uh, which he calls endurance. And he says there are two dimensions to it, basically. Patience, which means that you aren't overwhelmed when sorrow strikes and it's human life. So sorrow is bound to strike basically always. And then perseverance, which is to say when the going gets tough, specifically as you approach the end, uh, that final embrace of the Lord, which leads unto eternal life in the presence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? It supplies you with the graced wherewithal to pursue him unto the end. And so when St. Thomas talks about fortitude, he says, we often think about the attack piece, but truth be told, it's really endurance, which is characteristic of the virtue. It's endurance, which we are uh, asked to, you know, kind of marshal or to, or to put forward in most circumstances. And so I think that, um, yeah, that's something that during this, this time of waiting, we often think of waiting as fruitless, or we think about it as boring. When truth be told, it's a training ground where we become more enduring in our hope and our affection for the Lord as he sends us his spirit. And as we are drawn further up and further in to his plans for us and ultimately to the life eternal. In the letter of the Romans, of course, St. Paul is talking to a largely Gentile audience uh, in Rome uh, who don't really care about the promises to the patriarchs. They don't really care about the Jewish people and the circumcised. And what part of Paul's mission there is to get them to care, that they ought to care about this, care deeply, since firstly, it's the astonishing claim of Christianity that we are all brothers and sisters in the Lord if we are in the Lord. Now, the Jewish people had a hard time seeing this. There are hints of it, of course, as we've heard about in Isaiah and that the nations we brought in. But to actually be a member of the family, to be the part of the, the chosen people, you could say grafted in, as Paul talks about, it was hard for them to make sense of. It took a while. Just read the book of Acts and all the fits and starts with making sense of this, even between Peter and Paul. But the Romans are in just the same danger. The idea that the Jewish people don't matter to them, that God's rejected them. Uh, and that now God has given over entirely to the Gentiles. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Yes, of course we are. Uh, but more importantly, though, it's not just that the, the Romans should care about the Jewish people because they're brothers and sisters of theirs, but because of who God is in keeping his promises, that the promises to the patriarchs need to be fulfilled so that God is the God who keeps promises. Whether the Romans admit it or not, if God of Jesus Christ is not also the God of the circumcised, if he's not also fulfilling the promises and bringing the Jews with them, then they have no reason as Romans, as Gentiles, to trust him in keeping his promises to them. Because what makes the Romans think that they will be any better at keeping their part of the bargain than the Jews were with keeping their part of the bargain with God? nothing. They can only be faithful because God is faithful. That's why St. Paul cares about the promises to the patriarchs here. That's an important message to us too, that Christ came to fulfill, not abolish the old covenant, and bring about the new, that Jesus is not only for us Gentiles, 
but also for the Jewish people, the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the whole world, their, their story is part of our story, and our story is part of their story because it's the same God who is faithful to his promises to all of his people, whether we're always faithful to them or not. All right. As we turn now to the gospel, we'll hear from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. There is a Latin phrase that is near and dear to most Thomists, I think. Omne agens agit sibi simile, which means something like every agent causes something similar to itself. Said in the terms of baking, the shape of a cookie is the shape of the cookie cutter that made it. And so, if the way was to be made straight, one would expect a straightforward man to make it so, to prepare it by his straightforwardness. But here is elsewhere the gospel breaks all expectations, even metaphysical and Thomistic ones. For the man who is going to make the way straight is anything but straightforward. I mean, John the Baptist, wearer of camel's hair, eater of locusts. This is a strange and startling figure, and yet he is exactly what was needed to prepare the way and a reminder to the world that holiness sometimes looks extreme or radical, maybe even uncomfortable. To the world of the first century, John the Baptist was the voice to call the people into line with his sort of prophetic asceticism. And it's something that you see with all the prophets in the Old Testament. There's a sort of strangeness about them. And yet it's through their strangeness that you make a straight line to God again. In today's world, it may be no different that holiness is something that calls for a radicality and a witness in a particular way that doesn't always make perfect sense, but rather calls sense to be made perfect through it. This is what Flannery O'Connor said and practiced in her own writing. She said, when you can assume that your audience holds the same beliefs you do, you can relax a little and use more normal ways of talking to it. When you have to assume that it does not, then you have to make your vision apparent by shock. To the hard of hearing you shout, and for the almost blind you draw large and startling figures. As we're preparing an advent for the coming of Christ, the most startling, but most gentle, we are given John the Baptist as a witness and a reminder that holiness has a startling and unstraightforward character to it. So, um, I love this episode, or excuse me, this episode. Oh, wow. Self-promotion. I love this gospel for a variety <laughs> of reasons. <laughs> Ah, Gregory, get yourself together. I'm also realizing that the hose of my hydration bladder is evident in the frame because it's slumping off the top of my bureau or armoire back there. So alas and alack, I am at odds ends. Um, but I especially love this gospel because one, it's the preaching of St. John the Baptist, which actually precedes the preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although our Lord's preaching is very similar when he comes on the scene. And I think the Dominican charism is a kind of John the Baptist charism. 
we're called in a particular way to point awesomely and adamantly as somebody else, right? You're supposed to be self-effacing. You're supposed to be self-abnegating. You're supposed to get the heck out of the way so that other people can encounter the God by whom your life has been ruined in a good way. I mean, made wonderful. Um, so uh, it's wild that St. That John the Baptist begins his preaching with this call to repentance, right? So the first word that he says is repent, and then he returns to this notion of repentance two and three and four and a billion times, I imagine, during the course of his life. But here it shows up twice subsequently. And the word there, you've heard it, is metanoia, um, which can be translated in a billion ways. I am going to choosily translate it as think beyond. Um, so it, it means effectively that the gospel that's being proposed is going to entail thinking beyond our current limitations, not in like the self-help sense, like pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you know, make a plan of life and eat more kale. Um, but in the sense that like God is going to give you his own thoughts on the matter. God is going to overhaul your interior life, not because it's bad, but because it needs to be healed and it needs to be grown beyond its current limitations. And I think often in our moral lives, we just get accustomed to our mediocrity or we get accustomed to our compromises. And when the Lord comes on the scene, he just starts flipping tables, right? He just starts scouring corners. He just gets into all the nooks and the crannies. So that way he can deal with what prevents, right? The obstacles, the impediments, and give in abundance the things which help us or which facilitate our encounter with him. Um, so I'm thinking here again of, you know, Romans 12, this idea that we can be transformed by the renewal of our minds, that God can actually take hold of our interior life he can purify us and he can, you know, like revolutionize us in a way that really goes beyond anything that this present evil age can even imagine. So, yeah, this, this time of Advent is an opportunity to live on that higher plane as God reveals himself and then bestows upon us his grace and abundance. Um, we rightly title uh, the primary figure in today's gospel selection is John the Baptist. That's, that's what he's known as he baptizes. And Father Gregory, as you were talking about, you know, his baptism of repentance and the call to metanoia, um, how important that is, but he also promises something else that the one who will follow him will actually, he too will baptize, but it's going to be a different baptism. And so that difference between the baptism um, of repentance that become become so identified with John the Baptist. But then there's the promise of a new baptism, and it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. And I, um, I, I, I just find myself repeatedly drawn back to the image of fire, um, especially um, for, for the, that original audience that would be hearing that. What does that mean when they're hearing the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God and fire? Well, it, it starts to trigger all these images, you know, of um, the fire of Mount Sinai, the, the one that attracted Moses, that the burning bush that was burning a flame, but not being consumed. And then they hear, uh, they're, they're reminded of uh, the three young men in the, the hot burning fire, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which always makes me think of a Beastie Boys song. So I can't like ever read that passage without thinking of Beastie Boys, but that they were able to walk in the fire with the one who looked like the son of God in the midst and he was joined them in that fire. So instead of having this fire be something that's terror inducing, something that is destructive in, in so many ways, but divine fire is always different. Heavenly fire is different. And we see this in its fulfillment. So like, once again, this starts at the beginning, uh, it kind of precedes the Lord, this, spirit, this talking of the Holy Spirit, this talk of fire, this talk of some uniqueness of divine fire. And then we also see it in, in Acts at Pentecost when the fire descends on the apostles again, um, post-resurrection. And so we, we see this beauty in this focus of divine fire and to re recognize and realize with ourselves that the fire and the baptism of fire that is promised by John the Baptist today uh, that's connected to the Holy Spirit is nothing to be scared of. It is not anything to shy away from, but it almost in many senses draws one to itself. And we see that with natural fire. We see that with earthly fire, how magnetic it can be and how people are drawn to fire, but that the heavenly fire is not a fire that consumes. It isn't a fire that destroys, but that even new life can come through that fire. 
that um, it's it's one that is allowed to purify, but draws us into a newness of life that repentance is a preparation for, but almost this deep entry into a fire is where we encounter the one that is the son of God that walks with us even through those flames. But his divine fire is one that draws us into a deep encounter with that son of God. Boom. That's what we want. A deep encounter with the son of God, because at the end of the day, there's not really much else that matters. In fact, there's nothing that matters. <laughs> and anything that does matter can only be found in him. So let's get after it. Uh, so to conclude our, our time of meditation, we're just going to say the prayer uh, from the middle of the Mass of today. Uh, but don't, don't go anywhere because we have a couple cool announcements at the end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be pleased, O Lord, with our humble prayers and offerings. And since we have no merits to plead our cause, come, we pray, to our rescue with the protection of your mercy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I said a couple cool announcements. So the first is that uh, you might have heard on earlier episodes, this is our maybe like fourth mention of the fact, but we're having a fundraiser right now, which is explicitly for raising money. I guess that's what fundraisers are. Okay, right, so we're raising money for retreats. Why? Well, because we host retreats and um, updates or announcements on those retreats are forthcoming, but you can look forward to uh, different retreat offerings this summer or this upcoming summer and fall. But we want them to be available to people and retreats typically cost money and more than a lot of people would like to spend. And then you add in the cost of travel and it gets even more difficult. So we're raising money to lower the cost of retreats for those who would like to attend a God's Planning retreat this summer or fall. Um, so you can go to godsplanning.org and find out ways in which to give. And we're super grateful for anything that you can manage or muster. Um, and then the link to that is available in the show notes. The other thing is we mention it all the time, but this is a podcast of the Dominican Friars of the province of St. Joseph. So Dominicans are you know, spread throughout the world. We pertain to a province in the northeastern kind of mid-Atlantic United States. And right now, um, the director of the Dominican Foundation is raising money. It's called the Matching Challenge for Vocation. So raising money to support the ongoing efforts of formation in the province. So all of us were together in formation from 2010, 2016, 17. Um, you know, so doing an intensive time of like retreat slash boot camp slash, you know, boot camp, boot camp slash adventures in obedience slash academic pastoral spiritual formation, all of which, you know, costs money. So anything that you can mu muster or marshal, I think those are the words I used last time, uh, in that regard are also greatly appreciated. Um, so I think that's it. Those are my two announcements. Both of them are asking you to help us. So maybe they're not the most exciting announcements for you, but we're excited to announce them nonetheless. So thanks so much for listening to God's Planning. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like the episode, subscribe on YouTube or your podcast app, and leave a five-star review in the goodness of your heart. Uh, if, besides those other opportunities, you'd like to donate to the podcast on Patreon, you can follow the description. You can follow the link in the description or show notes, um, and there you'll also find links to shop our merchandise and get information for upcoming God's Planning events. The first of which will be announced at the beginning of March. So thanks so much for everything. Uh, know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on Godspeed.